Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's Free CompTIA A Plus Certification Training Course. I'm your host, James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about CPU technologies. The CompTIA exam objectives describe the un understanding the fundamentals of those CPU technologies in section 1.1 of course 220.601. So when you first take that first exam, this will be one of the topics that comes up. And as you can see, there are a number of very detailed CPU and processor technologies that you'll need to be familiar with. With all of these, we won't have to have an incredibly deep understanding, at least not a deep technical understanding, of exactly how they work. But you may be asked about the overview of what these different technologies mean on the exam. So it's useful to have an idea. This will also help you as you go through your career understanding more about how you should purchase different systems and how one technology may be better than another. Let's start talking about hyperthreading, how that affects and what we can see inside of a CPU. You'll see this written down often as hyperthreading technology or HTT. When somebody talks about hyperthreading, it's when one CPU, one physical CPU inside of a system looks like there is more than one CPU in that particular device. So one CPU which really looks to our operating systems, it looks to our applications as if there's really two CPUs inside of that single device. And this is exactly what I have in my system. I have a single laptop, but because my particular CPU supports hyperthreading to my Windows operating system, it looks like I have two processors in there. But let's not be fooled, the processor doesn't act as fast as two individual processors. We have that laws of physics we have to deal with after all. But it does increase the throughput and the efficiency when you can have both of those working in tandem and when your operating system can really take advantage of those. So what you'll see is a 15 to 30% improvement in how quickly and how efficient that CPU operates. So it's not acting as much as 200% performance, but there is a nice performance boost in having this hyper-threading technology built into the CPU. Now, the operating system has to understand hyper-threading technology. So if you're running Windows XP, that's an operating system, for instance, that does understand that. If you're using some older operating systems, they may not understand to be able to take advantage of that second CPU or what we can consider a second CPU inside of the system. For instance, if you're using Windows 2000, it's one that looks like it could support hyper-threading technology. But Intel has written and said, we don't really support hyper-threading technology and Windows 2000 working together. We haven't done a lot of testing with it, so we can't support exactly Windows 2000. So if you want to be able to take advantage of this, make sure you're looking at your operating system and you can see that it's able to take advantage of hyper-threading. Here's an example of how this will look if you have a system that supports hyper-threading and you're using an operating system that can understand it. This is from my task manager inside of Windows. And you can see here it has two CPUs that are, are doing different things at the same time. My CPU usage history has different percentages. It's doing two different sets of tasks. I have one single CPU in the system, but you can see the hyper-threading is using and operating that CPU and the different parts of that CPU individually. This is one thread, and this is another thread. And they're acting as independent systems, even though it is one physical CPU. In our introduction to CPU, video that we did. That video module talked a lot about the structure and the architecture of cache memory. Cache memory itself is very, very fast memory. Because it's so fast, it's also very expensive. So there's not a lot of it on a CPU. What we're finding these days, though, is we're able to use the memory in different ways. And those caches are getting larger and larger, especially the L1 and the L2 caches. The level 1 cache is usually on the CPU itself. In the past, we've thought of the L2 cache as being on the motherboard. But what we're finding more and more is that the L2 cache is now also on the CPU itself. Oftentimes, we'll have a level 3 cache that we'll find on the motherboard. Now, the way that this works is the CPU is going to need to perform a particular function. It's going to need something that's in memory. The first place it goes is to the L1 cache. and tries to determine if it's in that memory. If it's not there, it, that's called a cache miss. It goes out to the L2 cache to see if it's there. 
tries to determine if what it's looking for, that memory address that it may have asked for before, is a copy of it is still in L2. And if it's in there, it can use it. If it's not, it's going to have to go out to our regular random access memory that's on our motherboard. And the problem there, as you can see, it's regular slow memory, certainly much slower, relatively speaking, than what we can get from the cache. So the larger the cache we have, the more we can store copies of what's in our regular RAM memory. And so it becomes much more efficient when we have larger caches. When you start looking at acquiring new technology, you're buying a new computer, you're buying a new laptop, look at the processor, look at the CPU that's in there, and you'll see in the specifications for that processor, it will tell you exactly how much level one cache, and how much level two cache happens to be on that central processing unit. Here's an example of what you might expect to see. I used, for this example, a Pentium 2 processor because the cache, part of the cache memory in that processor is external to the CPU itself. So our processing takes place in the CPU chip that's in the middle. And in the case of the Pentium 2, uh, the cache memory is separate. It's offset, even though this entire a particular unit is the processor, you can see that the cache here is on separate chips. That's a little different than if you look at the Pentium 3. This is a die cut of the Pentium 3. When we talk about CPUs being little cities, this is like looking at a city from above. There's a lot of technology that's packed into one of those central processing units. And what you'll find is when you start looking at CPUs, and if you go out to Google and you just do CPU die, D-I-E, and you start getting images of those in a Google image search, you'll start seeing these sections of memory that look like cornfields. They are just these large rows of what appears to be empty area. And that's because that's your cache memory. That's where information will be stored temporarily during the normal processing. So if you start looking at these dies, you'll find that they're, the caches are getting larger, and you're finding there's multiple sets of them on the different processing units. The latest technologies of CPUs are using multiple cores. And you'll see that there are dual core, there are quad core, and they're looking at other systems that have even more cores per CPU. Each core has its own ability to do operations, to perform operations and calculations. So the more CPU cores you have in a system, the more independent operations can take place. We talked about hyper-threading technology is a very good example of, of using multiple cores of inside a single CPU. So each core, generally speaking, has its own L1 cache. And generally, you'll find that the L2 cache is one that's shared by all of the different cores in a system. So here's a, a very simple picture of this. If this is a dual core CPU, you'll find that there's one CPU core and a separate CPU core inside this dual core CPU. Each CPU core has its own cache memory. It's L1 cache. So it's going to look local to the core for any memory that it may need, any information that it may need from memory. If it's not there, it jumps out to the L2 cache. That's where the bus interface is to the rest of the system. And you'll notice that the L2 cache is shared by all of the different cores inside of that chip. Now, that's a technology that we'll see very common today. That may change as we go through time. But today, the L2 is something that generally is shared when we're talking about these multiple core CPUs. This is a picture of a multi-core CPU. This is a dual-core CPU, specifically the Intel Core 2 Duo. This is a 64-bit CPU. I happen to be using this in the laptop that I have right here. This has multiple cores. And if you look at it, you can even see that it's almost a mirror image of each other. There's a core on one side and a core on the other. And they're just duplicates. They're all independent entities as well. You can also see a very large cache memory area uh, the Pentium 3 we were looking at earlier had a relatively small size compared to all of the cache that's set up on the L1 and L2 cache that's built right into this Intel Core 2 Duo chip and the multiple cores that happen to be taking care of the processing simultaneously inside of my system. When we talk about CPUs, especially CPUs inside of laptops, you're going to find something called CPU throttling. And the first time you see this manifest itself, you might be thrown a little by it, especially if you expect a laptop to be running at a certain speed CPU. You may find that it's not running as fast as what you would expect. And that's because there's something going on called CPU throttling. 
This means that the CPU itself can scale itself down to run a little bit slower when there's not much activity on the system. It's also called dynamic frequency scaling. Often we just call it throttling because that's really how we recognize it it working and it's intentionally slowing down these laptops generally it's laptops where we find this type of technology built in the reason it's slowing down is because the slower a cpu goes the less voltage it requires the less power that's needed by that system and if you're in a laptop environment you know that when you're on the road you need as much power as possible it can only carry so many batteries with you so if there's technology that is the system sitting relatively idle that it doesn't need to use more power that's great that's a very very, very strong advantage for using that type of CPU inside of a system. It also is using less heat. And also with laptops, you'll notice these days with the higher powered CPUs, they get very warm. And if we're using less heat, that means that we'll have longevity of the hardware. It's not going to wear out quite as quickly. You'll see this uh, especially from Intel, they've assigned a name to throttling called Speed Step. So if you see this in the software or you see this in the, the technical detail specifications for your CPU or your system, that's what it's referring to. It's re referring to the CPU throttling technology. If you want to see what your CPU throttling is doing, here's a, this is a great program to use called CPU-Z. And you can find it at CPUID.com. CPU-Z will give you a lot of detailed information about your CPU. This is a screenshot from CPU-Z. This is on my system that's running an Intel Core 2 Duo. And you can see the information about exactly how fast it happens to be running at this time. Notice the CPU that I have in here is a 2.33 gigahertz CPU. But right now when I took this screenshot, you can see the core speed that's actually running is about a gigahertz. Well, this is a 2.33 gigahertz system that's only running at 998 megahertz. Did I not get my money's worth? No, it's running perfectly. What it's doing is because there's not much activity on my system, it is scaled down and only running at 1 gigahertz speed. And that's exactly the way it's supposed to work. If I started running uh, calculations, performing a lot of video functions, once I start editing this video, for instance, you can bet that this core speed is going to bump up to its full capacity because I'm going to need a lot more processing power to take place to be able to render video or run whatever I happen to be doing on that system. Another interesting thing that we're going to look at on here is something called instructions. You can see a lot of different instructions are written on here. Some you may recognize, some you won't. A very popular one recently was the MMX instruction set. And that instruction set refers to a set of microcode that's inside of the CPU. These are very specialized CPU instructions. And because they've been pre-built into the CPU, they can perform particular functions very, very quickly. They operate inside the CPU at the hardware level. Since they're instructions that are already ready to go, they're very, very fast. A very common one is called MMX. It's one that was marketed a lot by Intel. MMX is a microcode that allowed the CPU to understand more about multimedia processes inside the system. And it was introduced originally with the Pentium CPU from Intel. It stands, well, Intel, Intel says that it stands for multimedia extension. There have been other pieces of documentation that are referred to it as a a matrix math extension. So we're not exactly quite sure internally what Intel's called that, but externally to the world, they simply refer to it as MMX. There's many different kinds of microcode. MMX is just an example of that. But the more diverse sets of microcode that are inside a CPU, the more efficient that it's going to be in performing functions and instructions that are detailed specifically for that type of microcode. So if you've got an MMX CPU, it's going to be able to do multimedia type processes a lot better than a CPU that doesn't have MMX. It's a very good example of how microcode can improve the performance of a CPU. When you start working with CPU, you'll find that voltage is a very important piece of this. Different CPUs run at different voltages. Inside of my laptop, because I have that CPU throttling taking place, my CPU can run at different types of voltages all the time. When it needs more power, it asks for more voltage from my system. And it does that through a process called a voltage regulator module. You'll also hear this referred to as a power processing module. 
that voltage regulator makes sure that the proper amount of voltage is being provided to the CPU. And it knows what is expected because the CPU asks the voltage regulator module to pull a certain amount of memory from the system. And it does that through something called a VID, a voltage identification. The CPU asks what type says, I need uh, this particular kind of voltage, sends that ID through, and then the voltage regulator module tells the rest of the system to provide that level of voltage back. And you'll see that there's 3.3 volt voltages, there's 1.1 volt. It depends on what the processor needs at that particular time. We'll go back to our CPU-Z, and we can see that, in fact, this particular core VID right now needs 1.063 volts. As the core speed changes in my system, that voltage ID is going to change as well. So you may want to pull up CPU-Z on your system and start getting better understanding of exactly what voltages are taking place inside of your system. If you're working on a platform that is on a motherboard, these days many of the voltage modules are able to dynamically get assigned that voltage. But some of the older motherboards have, may have jumpers that you set what the voltage is for that CPU that you're putting in. So if you're installing a motherboard with that CPU, you may find that you have to really look into the documentation to understand what voltage that CPU requires and set your motherboard up to use that particular voltage. If you change CPUs, it may need a different voltage set. And you'll also want to check your motherboard specifications and see if your voltage regulator module is one that can adjust dynamically or if you need to set it specifically yourself with those jumper settings. CPU technologies are changing rapidly these days. And you'll find as you go out to purchase new pieces of equipment that you may need a 32-bit processor or you may find there are 64-bit processors out on the market. And this refers to the amount of information that you're able to process at one time inside of that CPU. Essentially, it's how much the width is of that bus that's able to send information back and forth. And the larger bus sizes, the more information that a CPU is able to calculate simultaneously, the more data it's able to move and the more efficient that it's able to be. 64-bit obviously can move twice as much as a 32-bit. Even 32-bit processors tend to have 64-bit buses. So it's able to transfer a lot of information and use that simultaneously inside of the system. When you look at a 64-bit architecture, if you're buying a system that's a 64-bit system, like my laptop is a 64-bit processor, the software has to be optimized to take advantage of that. I'm only running a 32-bit operating system on my laptop. Even though I have a 64-bit architecture underneath, I'm not even using the full capabilities of that. And that's because the operating system that I choose to use is one that works really well in 32 bits. If I move to a 64-bit architecture with my software, then I'm going to have to make sure that everything associated with my operating system runs at 64-bit. And these days, that may not be guaranteed. So you can't just decide randomly whether you're going to get 32-bit or 64-bit, there is a set of processes you have to think about. You have to think about the operating system that's going to run on and the hardware that you're going to use so that all of the device drivers also run at 64-bit. When we start trying to compare different personal computers, different laptops, different CPUs themselves, what you're going to find is there is a difference between what the real speed of a system might be and what the actual performance of that system really is. Historically, we have always thought of CPUs as performing as a certain clock speed. We look at a 1 gigahertz system and compare it to a 1.3 gigahertz system. And we've traditionally thought that the 1.3 gigahertz system is one that performs faster, it has a higher performance. But that's not necessarily true any longer. When we look at the technology, some of them we've talked about today, with hyper-threading and multiple cores of a CPU, and understanding what the size of an L1 cache and L2 cache might be, all of those different pieces go into the overall performance of a CPU. And depending on the different settings for those, a CPU could operate differently. If you go out to Intel's website, what you're going to find is that the processor descriptions there have completely moved away from a number of clock cycles. They don't talk about their processors as a number of gigahertz or a number of megahertz any longer. They talk about their processors as having different capabilities, different sized caches, different number of cores in the CPUs. And so they have models and model numbers these days rather than looking at just one individual piece of performance in that CPU.
The problem is when you want to start comparing one system to another and trying to understand the performance of one PC versus another PC. That's where it's hard because there is no broadly acceptable measure of performance. When we start trying to understand more about that, you often have to use a third-party benchmarking tool. There are a number of benchmarking programs that you can run on your system that will help you understand the overall performance. Each bench, benchmarking software might look at a different part of the system. Some might focus on CPU performance. Others might focus on graphical performance. There are a number of websites you can find if you Google for benchmarks that have already taken different benchmarks for different systems. So you can at least get a pretty good idea of what those might be. But if you want to get really, really detailed information, you're going to want to look at many different kinds of benchmarks and see how they're measured across different systems. When you start getting into more advanced capabilities of computers, or if you're someone who just likes to experiment with PCs, then you've probably heard of a technology called overclocking. This is when you tweak configurations of your system, usually you tweak those in the BIOS, to be able to get a little bit more performance out of your system. For instance, my laptop is running at 2.3 gigahertz with its processor, but what if I could increase the capabilities of my system so that CPU could run just a little bit faster? Well, when we start changing some parameters, maybe we're changing the speed of the front side bus, maybe we're changing the multiplier itself of the CPU and the way that it operates versus the crystal clock that's on our motherboard, or maybe we're changing the timings of memory. Maybe we're making a change to all of those different pieces to try to get the maximum performance out of our system. And when we start doing that, we're really pushing the capabilities of a system. It's very possible when you work in an overclocking environment that you're going to create a problem with those things. You don't want to create any issues, but you're really just trying to have fun with this. This is not something you would want to do on a production system with a production server. This is more of a hobbyist type technology in the way that we use these CPUs in a system. And that's because when you start pushing the capabilities of a CPU, you could destroy the CPU. You could damage it beyond repair. You can make it get so hot that it damages itself. It's certainly often going to also shorten the life of the components because we're driving driving them very, very hard. So you can expect that even though that that's something we're doing, it's going to require additional cooling. It may require additional fans inside of a system. And when we start doing this, you can also bet that the warranties associated with this system are going to be thrown out the window. There's no warranty when you start overclocking a CPU. And it's very obvious when you bring in a melted CPU that what you've been doing on that system. You know that there's been some overclocking going on. So something fun to play around with. But don't think that you're going to be using this overclocking technology in a production server that's going to be in your production environment. In review, we've talked about a lot of different CPU technologies today. We've talked about how hyper-threading and dual-core technologies can increase the overall speed and performance of your CPU. We've also talked about how throttling can decrease the speed of your CPU. As we go through looking at the way CPUs operate, we've got a better understanding now of how microcode and caching and these volta voltage regulator modules can change the way that CPUs operate. Indeed, the 32 versus 64 bit is going to be increasingly important as we go through time. And you can see how all of these things working together can really show us the differences between the real performance of a CPU and the actual performance of a CPU. And finally, we talked about how hobbyists might use CPUs and push them a little bit further through the use of overclocking. For more A-plus certification training for our message boards to get on our mailing list, feel free to visit our website at freeaplus.com.